Hello. I'm going to be talking to you today about FAIR data and also get a little bit into semantic markup. This will be the first lecture that introduces semantic markup, and then there will be an additional one later that will go into much more detail. For this lecture, I'm going to try to keep the concepts at a fairly high level so that you understand what semantic markup is, and in a later lecture, you'll understand a little bit more about how to apply it practically. So I wanted to start this lecture. Oh, oops. The learning objectives for today are the following. You're going to see how to prepare to share. We're going to talk about uh, sharing data. Develop familiarity with the FAIR data principles. And then you're going to prepare to share FAIR, learning how to incorporate the FAIR data principles into your work. Finally, we're going to understand the best practices for data publishing and more formal methods for making sure that your data is available for reuse. I'd like to start this lecture with a little video. This is a video that was made in 2012, and I think it illustrates the, as they call it, the tragedy in three acts of most data sharing. So just take a moment to listen to it. It's a few minutes long. Hello, my name is Dr. Judy Benign. I'm an oncologist at NYU School of Medicine. Hello, Dr. Judy Benign. I read your article on B-cell function. I think that I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. I am not an oncologist. I know, but I think I could use the data for my work on pancreatic cancer. Do you have the data? Everything you need to know is in the article. No. What I need is the data. Will you share your data? I am not sure that will be possible. But your work is in PubMed Central and was funded by NIH. That is true. And it was published in Science, which requires that you share your data. I did publish in Science. Then I am requesting your data. Can I have a copy of your data? I am not sure where my data is. But surely you saved your data. I did. I saved it on a USB drive. Where is the USB drive? It is in a box. It is in a box at home. I just moved. But can I use your data? There are many boxes. So many boxes. I forgot to label the boxes. Hello again. Thank you for sending me a copy of your data on a USB drive. I received the envelope yesterday. You are welcome, but I will need that back when you are finished. That is my only copy. I did have a question. What is your question? You might find the answer in my article. No. I received the data, but when I opened it up, it was in hexadecimal. Yes, that is right. I cannot read hexadecimal. You asked for my data and I gave it to you. I have done what you asked. But is there a way to read the hexadecimal? You will need the program that created the hexadecimal file. Yes, I will. What is the name of the program? Cytosynth. I do not know this program. It was a very good program. The company that made the program went bankrupt in 2007. Do you have a copy of the program? I do not use this program anymore because the company that made it went bankrupt. Maybe you can buy a copy on eBay. I have good news. You again. I talked to my colleague. She knew a person with a copy of the software. Then why do you need me? Everything you need to know about the data is in the article. I opened the data and I could not understand it. If you have the program, you will find it is clear. Well, I noticed that you called your data fields SAM. Is that an abbreviation? Yes, it is an abbreviation of my co-author's name. His name is Samuel Lee. We call him Sam. I see. And what is the content of the field called Sam1? Ah, yes. Sam1 is the level of CXCR4 expression. And what is the content of the field called Sam2? That is logical if you think about it. What is the content of the field called Sam2? I don't remember. 
What about Sam 3? Is there a guide to the data anywhere? Yes, of course. It is the article that is published in Science. The article does not tell me what the field names mean. Is there any record of what these field names mean? Yes. My co-author knows what the content of SAM2 is and SAM3. And SAM4. Can I talk to your co-author? I'm not sure. I would very much like to talk to your co-author. Well, he was a graduate student. He went back to China two years ago. Can I have his contact information? He is in China. His name is Sam Lee. I think I cannot use your data. You could check the article to see if what you need is there. Please stop talking now. So I think that that illustrates some of the common problems with data sharing very well, even though it's in 2012 and there are a few outdated references. I hope most of you don't keep your data on USB drives anymore. But it really shows that if you're planning on sharing your data, whether with colleagues or out in public, that there's some preparation that needs to be done. You need to prepare to share. Among the things that you should pay attention to is having a data management plan. Of course, you're required to have this in NIH and NSF grants. A lot of people don't pay careful attention to it, but you need to understand how to manage your data. Putting it on USB drives in boxes in the lab is not exactly a good plan. You have to actually implement good data management practices in the laboratory. Um, that also means that you need to practice good data stewardship, right? Manage your assets. And it may be that the ones that are going to take, take over your data or take responsibility for it are not yourself. For example, you may submit it to an institutional or a public repository who then takes ownership of the data, not in an intellectual sense, but in the practical sense, and ensures that it's available in open formats and some of the things that you heard uh, in this video. You also need to make sure that you have adequate documentation on how to reuse it. We often think that the paper is enough, but it's not enough, uh, as you saw in this uh, video. Uh, that includes also annotating your data so that it is understandable to other humans. So these are all practices that are involved in effective data sharing, whether that data sharing is with you and your colleagues, your future you and your colleagues, or with people that you don't know. There are a few things that this video actually didn't mention, which I think are kind of interesting. Uh, and one is that there was a lot of emphasis on other human beings understanding your data. And they do mention that you need a program to be able to open your data, right? Because it was in a proprietary format. But it's very important to recognize that without that program, without your data being actionable, without something being able to open and use it, then it's really sort of worthless. One of the most common data sharing uh, mistakes or errors that I see a lot in my work is that people will share um, data in a form where it's not useful. And that's illustrated very simply right here, but believe it or not, I've actually seen this mistake several times in supplemental data in papers. So we have two uh, tables here, the top one and the bottom, they're both covering the same thing. And you might assume that these are equivalent, but in fact, the one at the top is a picture of a table, and the one at the bottom is an actual table. So if I come out of full mode and you look at here, you see that this whole thing is an image. I can't select, I can't really do anything with it. If I wanted to be able to use this data for anything, I'd have to get some sort of optical character recognition software to try to crack the contents of it. In Contrast, at the bottom, this is an actionable piece of data. This actually comes from a Google spreadsheet. You see I can select it, I can copy it, I can paste it, I can calculate on it because I have things like age, so I can, uh, I can make an average age. So it's very important that when you're sharing data that you think about something called machine readability, right, or machine actionability. You need to have your data in a form that a computer can actually read it. It's not enough to just share for other humans. Another common error is this. Again, in the data sharing video, they were talking about defining their variables, and that's a good practice. 
And if I look at these three data sets, so these are fictional data sets that I've made up, I have data set one, data set two, data set three. They describe uh, an organism, in this case, a genetic uh, mouse strain. And it has an age, and it looks like it's studying some gene names and some locations. And if I look at this, this is perfectly human readable. This is the name of my knockout. And of course, you would need to know what uh, the knockout terminology is or knock in. This is a gene name, which is calretinin in a location, ACA. That's a little cryptic, but if I knew that this had something to do with the cortex, I might say, oh, well, that's the anterior cingulate uh, cortex. So this is perfectly human understandable. But if I look across, in fact, I can look at B6, PAC6, B6, CG, PAC6 has some similar elements, but is this in fact the same animal or is it not the same animal? Is calretinin and calbindin2 or calb2, is that the same gene or is it a different gene? What is CR? So you can see here in this case that there's a lot of information in here that is human readable, but the computer would have a really hard time understanding that in fact, these are the three same mouse, three, these three mice are exactly the same animal. It's just that people are using different shorthands for the name of the strain. And these three genes are exactly the same genes, but they're using different abbreviations. And these three brain regions are the same brain regions, but again, they're using different abbreviations. So the question then that we need to ask is, how do I make data? How do I publish data? so that it is reusable by both humans and machines, not just humans, but also machines. And that is where the topic of this lecture comes in. That was a bit of a preamble, uh, the FAIR data principles. So the FAIR guiding principles for scientific data management and stewardship are principles that help you make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. In other words, FAIR. And they are directed towards not just human understanding of what the data means, but so that the machine without a human intervening can do some of the operations that a human would who understands the data. So it is about making your data understandable for humans and machines. And of course, making it understandable if you can't find it and you can't access it doesn't do you much good. So a lot of people are familiar with the FAIR principles. They were issued in 2016, but actually arose from workshops that were held in 2014. Um, they were issued through uh, Force 11 by a group of people working through that organization. And a lot of people know the acronym FAIR. And in fact, it has been adopted by a lot of agencies such as the NIH, uh, the European Union, many places around the world are saying, we want to have our data FAIR. And I like to say that FAIR is a bit like mom and apple pie. Who is against it? Who doesn't want to make their data FAIR? And while many people know the overarching acronym, not many, as many people know that, in fact, there are 15 different FAIR principles. And they go into detail about not just that you should make your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, but they provide about 15 principles that tell you exactly how you might go about doing that. It's important to remember that the FAIR principles are aspirational. They are principles, that is, they cede a lot of authority to individual communities and individual scientific uh, applications to try to decide what this actually means with their domain. But they do give you 15 things that you should be paying attention to when you're producing data. So in the next part of the lecture, I wanna go a little bit more detail, not into all 15, don't worry, but into uh, some of these, especially the ones that are the most critical for achieving FAIR. So we'll start with findable. Findable, of course, is an extraordinarily important um, principle because as you saw in the data sharing tragedy, if you can't find the data in the first place, well, then you may as well throw the rest of the principles out. It doesn't matter how uh, beautifully prepared it is. So findable is first for a reason, not just because it makes a nice acronym, but in fact, it is critically important. And if we look at the four uh, sub-principles or whatever you want to call them that relate to findable, you see number one is data. And this little meta in parentheses means that both the metadata and the data uh, should both be covered by uh, 
what the FAIR principles espouse. So metadata and data are assigned a global unique and persistent identifier. Data are described with rich metadata. This metadata clearly and explicitly includes the identifier of the data it describes, and the metadata are registered or indexed in a searchable resource. So after the buildup on data sharing and that nice little video, you might be going, huh? Why is the first thing in the FAIR principles talking about identifiers? What does that actually have to do with data? There's an organization called GoFair that was established after the FAIR principles were issued who is concerned with all things FAIR. And they have a nice site that uh, describes the principles in more detail. And they basically say that principle F1 is arguably the most important because it will be very hard to achieve other aspects of FAIR without globally unique and persistent identifiers. Hence, compliance with F1 will already take you a long way towards publishing FAIR data. So what are these globally unique and persistent identifiers and why are they so important to the whole idea of FAIR data? Well, as their name implies, globally unique means globally unique means that they are unique in the world. That is, there's only one identifier that identifies a data set or an object, and it only identifies that object and not anything else. It's also stable or persistent. That means that it persists over time. That identifier never identifies anything else, so it doesn't get recycled and reused. And as we'll see, uh, the way that these persistent identifiers work is that there are organizations that stand behind them to make sure that they only point to one object and that they persist over time. And we'll see what that means in just a moment in the context of DOIs. As we'll also see, these identifiers can be resolvable. That is, these are things that are designed to work on the web, so you can plug it into a web browser and be taken to that object independent of its location. And this is really the critical feature of it, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail in just a moment. Now, these digital object identifiers are extremely important because, of course, they can take you to digital objects and you can reliably see them, but this also allows this digital object to be reliably tied to its metadata. And you saw that a lot of the other findable principles had to do with metadata. So we'll talk about what this means too in just a moment. So what are some examples of persistent identifiers or PIDs as they are called? Um, the DOI is perhaps the most famous. By now, if you've published any article, you know that your article gets a DOI. You can see that over here in a PubMed article. You notice it has other identifiers. These are accession numbers that are assigned by PubMed and PubMed Central, but it also has this DOI. And again, this is the only article that has this DOI. No matter where you find this article, it always has the same DOI. So it reliably identifies this particular digital object, which in this case is an article. DOIs are not the only types of persistent identifiers. I'm sure, again, if you've published an article that you have an ORCID, this is the researcher identifier. In this case, it doesn't identify articles, but it identifies your digital presence or you, your digital profile. There are research resource identifiers. That's something my group and I have been very uh, involved in. These identify uh, resources like antibodies or animals and uh, databases and such and such. And again, these are globally unique. They identify one thing only. You don't go back six years later and find this DOI pointing to anything but this article. And so again, unlike URLs or catalog numbers, they may not be reused. So it will never point to a spam site or anything else. It only points to this article. And I alluded to this in the previous slide. The reason why these are unique and persistent are not because there's anything magical about these particular strings of numbers that are different from URLs. They can still break if nobody stands behind them to make sure that they don't break. They could be non-unique unless somebody stands behind them, just like URL registries, and make sure they're unique. So each one of these identifier systems is backed by an organization that makes sure that these are issued properly and that they are maintained properly, okay? There's nothing magical about them. There's a human involved in this. 
So let's look at some PIDs in action. When we talk about data, there are many different types of identifier systems that use them. Mostly, if you submit it to a database, you will get a local accession number, just like the PubMed ID. But increasingly, you'll also see uh, repositories. This is the Open Neuro repository, which contains uh, fMRI data, will issue a DOI. And this, again, we talk about is identifies an object regardless of its location. It's issued by authorities, in this case, DataCite and CrossRef. And as I mentioned, there's an agreement that if you are something like Open Neuro and you want to issue DOIs, then you are agreeing that you will update the registry should the underlying URL that uh, locates this data changes. These are also resolvable. You plug it into your resolving service and you'll be taken to this object. So if we look down here, this is the DOI that was uh, issued to this particular data set. You can't see it on this screenshot, but we'll see it in just a moment. The actual DOI is this numbers here, this 10.18112, the Open Neuro DS 02149 version 1.0.1. So this whole thing is the DOI. Now, if I just take that DOI and I plug it into my web browser, it'll do a Google search and it will look for any place where anybody has used this DOI. If, however, I use the web protocol HTTPS, and I put in this doi.org, which is the resolving service ahead of it, it will actually take me to this data set. So I've created an actionable uh, URL or URI that lets me go and find this object. So if I click on it, in this case, I've now been taken to that data set in Open Neuro. You can see if you scroll down the DOI right here. Now notice that the URL itself is not the DOI. The identifier is not the location of it. The location of it is at Open Neuro at this particular URL, but that identifier resolves to this location. And that means that if Open Neuro transferred these data sets to someplace else, or it decided that it was going to change its name, or its system manager just didn't want to keep this location, it took it down and put it up. That means that it will still resolve to this data set, that DOI never changes, the underlying URLs can change. And why is this so important? Let's see, am I back in presentation mode? I'm not sure, I hope so. Why is this so important? Um, it's really, again, to avoid exactly this, the 404 error. If you've tried to follow data links inside of papers, you will know that over 50% of them break within just a few years. If you develop a database and maintain it, and you've crossed linked to some other database, you'll know that those links also break because the URLs change when there's a system upgrade or for whatever reason, and they break. If you use the DOI, they're not supposed to break, okay? So that's one of the main differences between a DOI or a persistent identifier and something like URLs. So URLs are not persistent identifiers, okay? You have to do special things to make them persistent. It's also true that accession numbers are not, are not persistent identifiers, mostly because they're not globally unique. So, whoops, where did I have it? Here, for example, is this data set in uh, Open Neuro. You see it has an accession number, DS002078 perfectly fine accession number, uh, you get them all the time. But if you actually search for this, so if I go ahead and I put this in my Google browser and I search for it, very nice, Open Neuro Datasets is number one, but you'll also see there's an Intel driver for Windows XP, something in Spanish on eBay. Uh, there's drink stirs and other things that are all identified through this particular number. This is not a globally unique number, okay? So accession numbers can be made into persistent identifiers. For example, if you put the rest of the namespace there that you saw, that's uh, going to be globally unique. But in and of themselves, they are not globally unique nor persistent, okay? So that's just a quick... Uh, foray into the nature of persistent identifiers. And as you're going to see, persistent identifiers really factor very, very heavily into the rest of this lecture. Because when we have these persistent identifiers, we can 
design better resources uh, for ourselves and also the web. We'll take care of a lot of the problems that you saw mentioned in that video and some of the slides afterwards. Okay, here we go. So then let's talk a little bit about metadata. I'm assuming everybody here knows what metadata is. You've already been probably using the ABCD resource. Course data are accompanied by metadata, descriptive information, and other types of information that accompany the data set that really make it usable. So we know what metadata is, or metadata are, but what are rich metadata? Again, FAIR doesn't tell you what rich metadata are. So you might be asking yourself, well, okay, what are rich metadata? And I got this uh, famous quote out from a Supreme Court justice that wasn't describing uh, data sets, it was describing, I think, pornography. But it said, I shall not today attempt further to define the kinds of material I understand to be embraced within that shorthand description. And perhaps I could never succeed in intelligibly doing so, but I know it when I see it. So just as with whatever he was uh, talking about here, obscenities, uh, with rich metadata, we can kind of tell it when we see it. So here, for example, are two um, examples of web resources. This is an older one. And if you go to this page, you're taken to this, uh, if this data set, you're taken to this page and it says it's phantom DICOM data. So it kind of tells you a lot already in there. And then you have this information MF in hand and year of birth MR session. So you might be able to sort of understand this, but it really doesn't give you very much information about this data set. Contrast with the data sets we saw for Open Neuro, where it has a lot more information. It has information uh, of structural metadata about the files. This is how big it is. Here's how many files are associated. Here's how many subjects are there. It's got various tasks. It's got documentation. You saw it had DOI. It's got authors, right? So I would consider this an example of certainly richer metadata than the previous example. And in fact, I would consider it fairly rich. Mostly when one is using this term in the concept, uh, in the context of FAIR, you're looking for things like a meaningful title and description, just like you would give to uh, a research article. Things like the study purpose that provide context for understanding the data. Things like techniques. So this is uh, T1W and bold and events. Contributors full data citation so that you can uh, cite this in a paper, instructions on how to use it, versions, access rights, subjects, and other study attributes. Um, this seems like it is, again, something that could go on and on and on because you might say, well, unless I know this, I won't be able to use the data. And as you'll see in the FAIR principles, this is not the only place that uh, metadata is mentioned. However, for the context of finding it, having a landing page where you have this type of information makes it a lot easier to search for things that might be relevant for you and also to understand it when you actually do find it. So this is rich metadata. The other thing about metadata that's important, again, in the context of FAIR, is that structured metadata, that is data that are organized according to a data model, generally are much more powerful and useful in these contexts than unstructured data. Unstructured data is still very useful. For example, a description would be considered unstructured because it's free text, and that's very meaningful to a user, uh, a human being. But of course, to a computer, structured metadata is much more powerful because you can use standard operations in order to be able to search for it and retrieve it. So what do we mean by that? Uh, again, I'm assuming this is review for a lot of you. Unstructured data is basically some sort of free text. So here would be a sentence that you might see in a paper, subjects comprise male n equals six and female n equals six, C57 black six mice, age 25 days. In a database or a structured data model, you might see something that says, well, there's something called a subject group and this is subject group number one. And there's an organism and its value is mouse. There's something called age and it's an integer and it's 25 and there's age unit, which is days, so on and so forth. So this means if you have it structured like this in a formal data model, you can use formal query languages in order to be able to retrieve something like, well, I would like to see all mice that are uh, less than 25 days of age, 
course, in this case, you wouldn't because I, I, I told you that, that they only use 25 days old, but it basically would allow you to do these types of operations. To try to get that out of an unstructured text, you need things like text mining and natural language processing. But here, it would be a very simple query. Show me all mice that are age 25 year, uh, days and older, okay? So that's just very quickly what a structured metadata are. Well, why do I bring that up? Because when we combine these persistent identifiers and structured metadata together, some very powerful things can happen when you have your data in, a, in, a, in, in this form and available, for example, on the web. So we can link objects together. We know that if a, this data set has a DOI and there's another data set that says, we imported this particular data and they give you the DOI, we know the relationship between those because the DOI serves as a key that links these two things together. We can use these identifiers to reliably retrieve any structured metadata that is associated with that object. So this is a data set, it's DOI, uh, right here, I don't need to read it for you. Uh, this is in something called the Open Data Commons for Spinal Cord Injury. And I can actually take advantage of this using, for example, an online reference manager. So I wanted to give a little demonstration. Here we've been taken to that page. Again, notice the URL is not the DOI. The DOI just resolves to this URL. And I have a, a web plugin installed for Paperpile, which is an online reference manager. And it says, well, I can't find any papers here, but do you want to add this as a website reference? And I'm going to say, why, well, yes, I do. So I go ahead and I add it. And what's interesting here is you notice that it does know it's a data set. So it actually recognized that this is a data set. It extracts all of that information. It knows that this is the title. These are the authors, just like it would a regular um, citation. And here's the study purpose. It's able to do that because I supply it. Once it sees the DOI, it says, oh, this is the metadata that is associated with that DOI. I can pull that metadata and I can make it available here. It's actually going to the data site registry to pull that metadata. So it's a very powerful thing when you use these identifiers because you can now start to hook together these programs, for example, and automatically pull that data without you having to retype it in. So you've linked these things together. The same thing in ORCID. When you put your ORCID there, it pulls the metadata about you and it pulls all of the work together that you've done and puts it in one location. So very, very powerful things when you use these identifiers. I may as well just show you my profile. So this is going to go to my profile and you'll notice that it has my employment, which I had to add manually, but all of my funding, all of my articles, those are all pulled directly from PubMed and funding sources because my ORCID has been associated with these records. So PIDs and metadata together are extremely powerful tools for making data available and fair. Okay, let's go on to the next one. So that's findable. The next is accessible. And here we have one, two, three, four tenants. Uh, A, one is metadata are, meta and metadata, metadata and data are retrievable by their identifier using a standard communication protocol. So you just saw, for example, HTTP is able to pull a whole lot of information uh, on uh, the DOI and also on my ORCID. The protocol is open, free, and universally implementable. Right, so HTTP, these type of things are all free. The protocol allows for authentication and authorization procedure when necessary. It's important to recognize that FAIR is not equivalent to open. Uh, of course, in data sharing, uh, those of us who are in open science, we push for as much uh, openness as possible. But FAIR says you need to be able to uh, authenticate and authorize if this data isn't for everybody. We have a little saying. Uh, in the open science community that data should be as open as possible and as closed as necessary. For example, if you're dealing with identified human information. And metadata are accessible even when the data are no longer available. 
So this is really an important one. It keeps those links from breaking. It may be that you have a good reason or someone has a good reason of taking down a data set, for example. Uh, maybe it's extraordinarily big and it has been supplanted by something else, or maybe an error was found in it. But the best, the rule of thumb, just like with books being out of print or articles that are perhaps uh, no longer accessible, you still have the metadata. So the DOI still resolves to a landing page that says, this thing used to be here, but it's not here anymore, but this is what was here when it was here. So it gives you that basic descriptive metadata, and then it tells you this thing is no longer available. In this way, again, the, the, the web, the links, don't break. So the, the, the chain doesn't break, the chain of evidence doesn't break, even though you may not be able to get the underlying object. And that's not unheard of, right? We find books that we no longer can get. We find articles that we can't get because of payrolls or because our library doesn't have a copy, but we at least know what that metadata, the metadata are, okay? So that's what that means. Um, interoperability, and we're going to talk a little bit more about or give some examples of accessibility, but I wanted to cover uh, accessibility and interoperability together. Interoperability is that meta, uh, metadata and data use a formal, accessible, shared, and broadly applicable language for knowledge representation. Metadata use Meta and data, metadata and data, that's hard to say, use vocabularies that follow the FAIR principles themselves. Okay, so this is going to be important and we'll spend a fair amount of time on it. Metadata include qualified references to other metadata. That's somewhat cryptic, but we'll explain a little bit about what that means to the best of my understanding uh, when uh, in just a few moments. Okay, so FAIR vocabularies. Why would you say that a vocabulary is FAIR? Isn't this about data? In fact, FAIR really applies to any digital object. So you could see that I could make, I can't make myself fair because I, of course, exist in the real world, but my digital profile, my profile that manages my information online can be made fair. I have my persistent identifier, I have metadata, I have access to it, I have all the things that are required uh, for fair. The same is true of the vocabularies that we use to populate our databases, to describe our data. Our goal is to make them machine processable, machine actionable, whatever you want to call them, machine readable. So that means that the concepts that we use to describe our science themselves have persistent identifiers. They have metadata that are associated with them. They have qualified relationships to other things. The place that we see this most fully realized are in things called ontologies and also controlled vocabularies. Ontologies are representations of human knowledge that are, com that are machine computable, so that the machine can make the same sort of inferences that a human being can. There are many of these used in biomedicine. This gives you an example of one that's called Uberon, which is an anatomical ontology. And here we have our structure that we referenced before, the anterior singular cortex. Singular cortex. But it has an identifier. It has an ID this Perl oboe Uberon 0009835, okay? So it's got a unique uh, URI that uniquely identifies it. It can also be dereferenceable. That is, I can plug this into a web browser and I can be taken to this representation on the web in many cases. It's got a definition, it's got additional metadata, and it's got relationships. So we know that the anterior cingulate cortex, for example, is part of the cingulate cortex. Backing this is a formal knowledge language. You saw that referenced in the uh, interoperability that it uses a standard you know, language for representation that's computable. In this case, it's something called OWL. So this is how we make our vocabularies fair. Why is that very important? Well, we already saw the example in our little fake mouse data set where we had multiple ways of referring to the anterior cingulate cortex. The beauty is, is if I use this Uberon identifier to annotate my data or in my underlying database, it means that I have made these unambiguous. Now, this is not to say that you've correctly defined the anterior cingulate cortex in your data. That is really up to uh, the our understanding in science and how accurate you are in your annotations. 
but these ontology identifiers ensure that assertions about the meaning of data are unambiguous. The computer does not care which of these things that you use to use your human readable label because it understands that these are all variants of this particular concept. Similarly, it doesn't have to recognize that this is the anterior cingulate cortex using some sort of spatial representation. This is data about it, and if it is annotated with this ID, then in fact, we can always resolve to it, and we know that, that I can take this data set and this data set and compare them because they are both asserting that they are about the same region. So this is a very, very important and powerful concept about fair vocabularies. And when we talk about semantic markup, this is a large part of it because we're using these identifiers to make sure that our annotations are machine readable and that the computer can draw the same conclusions that we can, okay? So here are some examples of unfair vocabularies that we saw before where we have these kind of cryptic names. Turns out they're all variant and they all reference the same mouse. Turns out these reference the same gene as we already saw before. All of these reference the same brain region. If in our underlying data annotations, we use the research resource identifiers, which cover things like transgenic mice, we can see in fact that these are all the same identifier. Uh, NCBI gene gives identifiers to these genes. Again, these are all recognized variants of the same name. And Uberon is an ontology that gives identifiers to uh, the, these brain regions and in fact other anatomical structures. So you see how powerful it is if you use these FAIR vocabularies inside your data resources and for annotations because it lets us disambiguate and also lets us link, as we'll see in just a moment. So I1 and I3 really talk about this formal languages and common languages, well understood languages for representing information inside of a database or a data set. And then also these qualified references to other things. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail on this. I think you're going to have an introduction to this in much more depth later on. But I wanted to show you at a high level what these things mean at some level, okay? So we can take that data set that you saw before, which says I've got a set of attributes, I've got age, organism, gene names, these all reference a data set. And instead of just putting them in a table, I can actually start to define the relationships between the things that are in my data set. So I have something called a data set. It gets a DOI. It probably has a creator, say myself, and I have an ORCID. I have studied subjects in them. In this case, it, it's a mouse. It has a strain and it's got an RRID. This has a taxon ID from NCBI. It studies genes and NCBI gene gives those identifiers and it references anatomical locations and Uberon references, uh, gives us the identifiers for those. So I can take those entities and I can each represent them separately, each with their own identifier. But you'll also notice that these are all related to data set uh, number one and that some of these are related to each other. So this particular strain is a strain of mouse. So you notice that there's a relationship that goes between them, which says this particular strain is a strain of mouse. You'll also know that the strain expresses a gene and that this gene has an anatomical location. So you'll notice that I have given names to the relationships that exist between these concepts. And these relationships themselves can have their own identifiers. So everything can be fair. They can have their own unique identifiers, again, so that they can be reused and referenced across multiple places, uh, multiple different data sets. So essentially, a qualified reference is a cross-reference that explains its intent. It basically doesn't just say that there's an arrow that goes between strain and organism but it tells you something about that relationship and those relationships themselves are fair. There's actually a language, which I think you'll hear about a lot in the next lecture on semantic markup called RDF, which stands for Resource Description Framework, that is considered a standard model, right? So a generally applicable and broadly understood uh, language, a standard model for data interchange on the web. 
it actually lets you express this relationship, which is just a diagram here, in a machine computable way. And so these are parts of the things that are meant by FAIR. RDF is not the only way to do this. There are many computable formats, but it is one that actually lets you start to build up these networks and was specifically designed for representing data on the web. It was designed for these types of linkages. And these linkages can be within a data set, but as you'll see shortly, they can also be across a data set. So if we take data set number two, which may be in a wholly different resource someplace else on the web, it still has its DOIs, it has its ORCIDs, it has its RRIDs, its NCBI gene IDs, and its uh, Uberon IDs. So therefore, a computer could look at data set one and data set two and say, oh look, right? These in fact are studying the same exact strain because their RRIDs match. And if we can link across these identifiers, if we know that we're studying common entities, then we can also mash up and integrate the data. We can make it interoperable because I can take data set one and data set two and combine them together in meaningful ways. And more importantly, the computer can do some of that operation for me because I have these underlying identifiers and machine computable relationships. So I hope that that's clear. These are confusing concepts in many ways. I didn't want to get too much into the details or even show nasty little examples of RDF because uh, I think that they could confuse. And again, you will see that in later lectures. But this is really the essence of what is going on here. We're trying to design data resources so that they're usable in a web context, which means I can link across, just like you have your hyperlinks, across from website one to website two, but instead of just clicking on a link and being taken there, we're saying something about the meaning of that relationship, right? This is in fact the same thing as this, and this is related to these other things. I wish I had a live audience so you could ask questions and I could look at your faces and see if you understand it, but I hope that you do, and I hope that some of the materials we provided will also help. So finally, let's talk about reusability. Okay, we've made it findable, accessible, interoperable. What about reusable? So here's that metadata thing again. Metadata are richly described with a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. So you know, just in that rich metadata, it was fairly high level, but here it says, hey, you need a plurality of accurate and relevant attributes. Again, fair uh, leaves that to a community to decide what constitutes accurate and relevant attributes, and even individual investigators. But basically, a good rule of thumb is as much metadata as you can acquire, you should acquire it and document it. Metadata are released with a clear and accessible data usage license. Now that may seem sort of an odd thing to put in here, but we're gonna talk about that in just a moment. Date metadata are associated with detailed provenance. Extremely important that provenance includes you, who was the person who produced it? Where was it produced? Why was it produced? Also, if it's derived from something else, if there are multiple versions, all of these things can be uh, collapsed under detailed provenance. And metadata meet domain relevant community standards. So again, there's something that FAIR doesn't define, but it's very important that if there's a community standard that actually governs the way that the data should be organized, annotated, whatever it is, that it should adhere to that. Because again, that's an extremely important piece of reusability. So we'll look at just a few of these right now. We're not gonna talk more about metadata, although we could go on and on and on about that, but I think you're gonna hear a lot about that uh, in subsequent lectures. But why are data licenses here? Why is that one of the FAIR principles? There's a really nice quote from an article uh, on intellectual property, and it says, legal uncertainty interferes with the productive reuse of research data. So if you come across data on the web, do you know what you're allowed to use it for, what you're not allowed to use it for? Are you allowed to share it with somebody else? Are you allowed to have a copy on your local computer? Maybe, maybe not, right? You wanna make sure that people understand what are the rights that they have to be able to reuse this. Use of clear licenses as part of the metadata or data set makes this absolutely explicit. And there are a bunch of licenses that have been designed for data on the web. The most commonly used are Creative Commons licenses. 
um, designed to make rights really easy to understand. So it's not these 60 page data use agreements, but it's very, very simple. Some of the most common ones are CC0, which is preferred for data, it basically means it's in the public domain and people are free to use it and free to distribute it. CC BY, which means you're free to use it and reuse it, but you need to make sure that you attribute the source. CC and C means free for academics and nonprofits, but if you're a commercial entity, you can't use it. Uh, and many of these are now machine processable. So if a computer sees a CC BY license, it knows what its rights are and same with CC and C. So these things are very, very important. Um, I should say that CC0 is preferred uh, because even uh, a lot of academics don't like the CC0 license. In uh, Open Neuro, they're covered by CC0 because they want to make sure that they are attributed. We saw that, in fact, good fair practice also supports data citation so that you can be credited for the uh, data sets that you make available. And people are afraid that if they make it CC0, then they're not legally going to be required to cite you. But in fact, even if attribution isn't a legal requirement, good scientific practice and norms require that you cite the source. So it doesn't really matter whether it's legal, you're not allowed to pass off somebody else's data as your own. The reason why they like CC0 rather than CC BY is something there's 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 various arcane reasons but one of them as i understand it is attribution stacking so it makes perfect sense that if i take your data set and i use it that i should cite you but then if somebody takes my data set and i've cited your data set then they have to cite me and you and you can see that that can get very very complicated very very quickly so it would be like publishing a review article and you having to cite everybody that any one article that you cited also cited. So CC0 is completely unencumbered. It's the freest license and it's the one that is preferred for data, but many academics are uncomfortable with this because of course they do want to have attribution and um, they will put the attribution license on. So that's a very quick uh, journey through licenses. Um, the last thing I want to cover are community standards and specifically for neuroimaging. Neuroimaging is very lucky in that it actually has now what I would consider to be community standards. After many, many years, I think this is finally starting to take hold. And you can imagine how uh, useful that is when trying to reuse data, that if you get data from somebody else, that it uses a standard. Once there's a standard that's accepted, you can develop tools around it. It means that you know that you will be able to uh, open it up and reuse it. You'll understand how it's organized. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. There is an organization called the INCF, the International Neuroinformatics Coordinating Facility, and they have, uh, they're an international organization that have been involved in standards, developing standards for neuroscience for quite some time. Um, BIDS came out of a workshop that was originally sponsored there, although Russ Poldrack and his group have uh, taken, uh, taken it uh, very, very far, but some of the initial convening meetings were held through support with INCF. Um, the Neuroimaging Data Model, or NIDM, which I know you're going to hear a lot about later in the context of ReproNIM, was also uh, developed uh, through an INCF working group. And INCF has now been reviewing and actually endorsing standards if they meet certain criteria. So BIDS was in fact one of the first standards that was endorsed. If you go to INCF, there's a catalog there. And NIDM is one that is currently under consideration. So neuroscience and neuroimaging in particular is really starting to embrace standards. And we're very fortunate now that there are good ones available. And again, I know that you'll go through this or have already, so I don't need to go into details. But basically, if you're using BIDS and you're using NIDM together, then you will actually cover a lot of what we just covered in terms of making your data fair. So it's a very, very uh, powerful way of doing this. You'll see that NIDM is in self, uh, stores metadata as graphs in a resource description framework or RDF format. So when you learn how to do this, it's going to go a long way towards making your data fair. So just to sort of summarize, uh, this is a nice uh, picture of what is called a fair data object. And as we can see, it can be data, it can be vocabulary, it can be data about people, it can be any type of digital object. 
Basically, you have the core bits, the digital object itself. You have identifiers that wrap these. You have standards and code that can be used to operate on these because they're made in a way that um, is standards compliant. And then you have lots and lots of metadata, both rich and other types of contextual, the plurality of relevant attributes associated with it to make these usable. And this is considered a FAIR data object. Okay, so that is basically FAIR in a nutshell. I imagine right now you're going, well, that was a lot of information and what the heck am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to make my data FAIR? I think that that's FAIR, uh, pardon the pun, but FAIR sort of lends itself to a lot of puns. And the good news about it is that I, FAIR is really a partnership. Uh, so I have variants of the slides in, in many of my presentation. And really, if you ask me, the roles and responsibilities of these different entities is fairly clear. They benefit from organizations like the INCF, which are community organizations that can help interpret and support FAIR on behalf of a community, in this case, the neuroscience community or neuroimaging. But what do you as researchers have to do? Well, it goes back to that original video, right? Good data management is absolutely essential for FAIR. If you're not collecting good metadata, making sure you know where your data are, make sure they're in stable resources so that you can reliably retrieve them, then being able to publish your data in a third party repository or anything else is extraordinarily difficult. So if you don't start from the beginning to prepare to share FAIR, then you really are in trouble. So good data management is at the uh, core of it. The good news about good data management is it helps everybody. It helps you, it helps your students, your postdocs, your colleagues, right? It helps future you. It also helps third parties who may wanna be able to use your data, but it's good for everybody. So a good data management plan and a good infrastructure is absolutely critical. Um, paying attention to things like open formats. So you heard about the, what happens with uh, proprietary formats. Well, that software is probably going to uh, disappear at one point. So thinking about the formats that you save your data in over time are also very, very critical. Adopting and aligning to standards, understanding the standards that govern your field and the metadata standards, file format, file organization, all of those. Those are all things that you need to pay attention to. But one of the most important things after you've done your job to ensure that your data is fair is actually to submit to a repository. Submit it to a third party trusted repository that is, will be a responsible steward of your data. And they will take care of things like issuing persistent identifiers, making sure that there's machine-based access. They'll help you uh, choose a license for your data or they may only have one that they have. Um, they'll continue to support open and domain specific standards. They'll have machine readable metadata. They'll support data citation so that you can get credit for your link. They'll think about things like future friendly formats. And so if a format goes out of date, they'll convert the data over. So submitting your data to a data repository is incredibly important and goes a long way towards making your data fair to the extent that they support fair. These types of repositories can be institutional repositories. So there may be places at your university that will host these. They can also be community repositories, but they are incredibly important. You don't have to do everything on your own. And indeed, you issuing a persistent identifier without being able to ensure that it's going to resolve for the long term is kind of pointless, right? So hosting data on a website putting it even in supplementary materials. These are not ideal. They will not make your data fair, but putting it into a, a repository will. And then there are things like indexers and aggregators, search engines that will be able to find and use your data. So therefore you break this down, there's responsibilities that you have, but then you can transfer over those responsibilities to others to maintain things for the longer term. So I know that this is something you're going to hear about later, but I just want to introduce neuroimaging has excellent resources for public sharing of data and even um, private sharing of data. So we already introduced open neuro as one, but ReproNim itself is developing um, a really powerful infrastructure for you to be able to uh, annotate your data according to bids, NIDM and other things, keep it in your local store and then be able to share it with 
uh, public metadata stores. This data can be stored in many different places. In addition to Open Neuro, you have Dandy, Neymar, Nitric IR, NDA. There's a lot of excellent repositories for you to use. And ReproNim is really helping to develop some of this coordinating infrastructure. So just to wrap up, FAIR and you. FAIR is defining best practices and community norms for publishing data for reuse. NIH data policies are being revised. Funders are not pushing for less data sharing, they're pushing for more. And in fact, more formal data publishing. By data publishing, I mean that you're paying attention to how your data is going to be made available to the public. Um, routine data sharing will become the norm. I'm not saying that this is easy. FAIR data takes time, effort, and resources, but it really is at the essence of good data stewardship. And again, I'll say this over and over again, because everybody says, well, why do I want to make data that's reusable for other people? The people who often go and get data out of these public repositories are the people that put it in there because they don't have to worry about Sam Lee going to China and they don't have to worry about the USB drive disappearing. They have it in a stable resource. They can reliably find it. They can go to their postdocs who will go and retrieve that data from this repository because there it is. So the ones that are most likely to benefit from fair data practices are you, your PI, and future you. Because you'll have well-documented, well-annotated, with non-cryptic vocabularies and formats, and rich metadata associated with it. So that is the end of my introduction to FAIR. And uh, I hope that if you have any questions, you will contact me. I think all of our contact information is available. And thank you very much for listening. <laughs>